All right, thank you so much for joining me. Today, we're gonna to be learning about Psalm number 116, 116. And the Psalm book that I am utilizing is coming from Kehot Publication Society. It's published at 770 Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn, New York. And 770 is the headquarters for Chabad, which is the like universally accepted um, authority in Judaism nowadays. It's where the Lubavitcher Rebbe um, taught and um, a lot of his students still are very loyal and faithful and remain there to this day, studying and praying and worshiping. And it's still considered by um, most sects of Judaism to be the leading authority on Jewish matters. So this book of Psalms utilizes commentary from the Talmud, Midrash, Kabbalah, commentators, and Hasidic masters. So there's a lot of depth and they bring a lot of resources to explain the various verses because there's so much more than the surface level when it comes to any scripture. And so this book of Psalms really dives deep. <clears throat> All right, so Psalm number 116, First, I'm going to give a little overview. So this psalm contains magnificent praises to God. King David describes why it is proper for him to love God in light of all the miracles he performed for him. David does not know how to repay God, declaring it is impossible to repay all that God has done for him. And I'm sure many of us feel the same way. <clears throat> God bestows uh, undeserved kindness upon humanity. And so the first verse that I want to discuss is verse six in my book. And in some of the English translations, it might be verse five, because the first verse sometimes appears as the title. So in Hebrew, it's Shomer Ptaim Adonai, God watches over fools. So now it's going to tell us <laughs> the meaning of this definition. The fool who cannot figure out how to save himself from trouble, but trusts in God, receives God's protection. The clever person should therefore not put his trust in the intelligence and machinations um, since they are futile without God's blessing. So sometimes we have very intelligent people such as scientists who may have high IQs and they might be atheist because they try to rationalize or intellectualize God and instead of trusting and having faith and uh, and so forth so sometimes intelligence and our own like stubborn inability to grasp things that are like above nature gets in the way with just simple faith. So the main take home lesson from this verse is that sometimes like the fool is uh, protected more than an intellectual or clever or smart person because of his or her simple faith in God. So simple faith goes a long way and it's something that um, we should all strive to have is just simple faith in God. So then in verse nine, <clears throat> the English is, I shall yet walk before God in the lands of the living. And so this is the commentary about that. The psalmist uses the plural lands of the living because the land of Israel supports two modes of spiritual life. When the temple stood in Jerusalem, godliness was overt and obvious. The spirit of prophecy pervaded the land, and the nation as a whole lived a holy and spiritual life. After the temple's destruction, and it was destructed twice, God's presence receded. His influence no longer directly uplifts those living there. And yet God's presence is potentially more potent in the Holy Land now than it was in the times of the temple. <clears throat> to illustrate, an idea, while still in the mind of its thinker, is inaccessible to others. Yet, it is precisely then 
that it is most pure. The spoken idea, by contrast, is accessible to others, but it does not represent the purest form of the idea. Similarly, during temple times, God's presence in the Holy Land was as if he were speaking, whereas now it is as if God were thinking. <clears throat> in temple times, God was more perceptible, more revealed, and now he's more concealed. But one could only perceive God's spoken self. Today, God is less perceptible in the Holy Land. God no longer, quote, speaks. But those righteous individuals, such as the Arizal, who manage to perceive God through the darkness, are perceiving God in his state of thought, in God's state of thought. Their divine perception is therefore even greater than the prophets of old. Well, that's very deep and it kind of, it's hard to grasp, but I thought it was interesting to share. And there's um, another thing that I want to share, which comes from verse 13. <clears throat> Sorry, I just had lunch and now I keep having to clear my throat. Um, verse 13 says, Kos Yeshuot Esa Uveshem Adonai Ekra. You might recognize that if you do uh, Kiddush on the Sabbath day, because that line appears in the Kiddush. And something that I have noticed while, while studying the Psalms, as well as studying scripture, is a lot of the verses are utilized in prayers, whether it's the Sabbath ritual prayers or the daily prayers. A lot of the verses that we find in Psalms come into um, prayers as well. So what are we talking about here? The The translation of the verse that I just read in Hebrew is, I will raise the cup of deliverance and invoke the name of God. <clears throat> okay, so now it's going to do a deep dive into why is it called a cup of deliverance? See the cup behind me? We're getting there. <laughs> so the cup of deliverance is a metaphor, and this is this is like my, my favorite part of the whole psalm. That's why I did this theme in the background. All right. <clears throat> so the cup of deliverance alludes to that the cup represents a vessel. So something to contain God's deliverance, God's blessings, like uh, abundance and prosperity that God bestows upon us. So I just want to pause right there and um, mentioned a few things. So behind me is a cup that was used for Kiddush. Kiddush is the blessing over either wine or grape juice that we do on Friday night and Saturday at lunch and during many other Jewish holidays and festivals and occasions such as a wedding. And I want to point out something. So you notice the way that he is holding the cup. Um, I have a cup here too to demonstrate. We hold it from the bottom. Oops, it doesn't. Here we go. And this is a this symbolizes that we are receiving. We don't hold it from the side. Whoops, <laughs> like this. We hold it from the bottom, and that is um, very deliberate. And the same thing, if you have a kiddush cup, a wine glass that has a stem, we do not hold it from the stem. Same thing. It's um, important to hold it from the bottom. And this is because oh, I want to show you the beautiful artwork on my Kiddush cup. I got this as a, a wedding gift, <laughs> this Kiddush cup. Um, so the reason behind that is that um, we are receiving God's blessing. So the way that we receive is with open hands, right? When somebody, somebody gives you something, you have to have an open hand to give it, to, to receive it. So having your hand on the bottom of the Kiddush cup like this, it's allowing you to receive the blessing. And then furthermore, when you do Kiddush, we um, lift it up with the right hand. It might be flipped because of the whole Zoom thing. So this is my right hand. So we lift the cup off the plate with our right hand. We transfer it to the left hand, and then we place it on the right hand. And this is a whole like Kabbalistic thing. But the right side represents chesed, which is loving kindness. The left side represents gevura, which is boundaries or um, strictness or sometimes harsh judgments, which are also for our ultimate greater good. But we are 
sort of converting, as it were, any harsh judgments into sweet, loving kindness. So we do this whole thing of passing the cup from right to left to back to right and receiving the blessing. And then also, furthermore, <laughs> when we pour the wine or the grape juice, we and it has to be red. <laughs> it has to do more with Kabbalistic colors and stuff. And that has to do with um, red, I think, is the color of Givura which is um, the strength and, and boundaries. And it we pour the wine, it has to overflow. So you could see that there's some like drops here on the cup. That's because we want, it symbolizes like the overflowing of abundance and blessing. Okay, so that was a little detour on Jewish customs and rituals. There's, there's so much more to um, when we say the Kiddush, we also look at the Shabbat candles, um, to bring the light into our blessing. And we also have one last quick um, ritual is that when we say Kiddush, we look at the fluid inside and you look for the reflection of your forehead. And then when you see your forehead in here, it's also a sigula or like um, a merit for Parnasa, which is prosperity or abundance, because in, in uh, Gematria, which is numerology, the word for abundance and the word for forehead add up to the same numerical equivalent. And so um, that's another thing that we do. Okay, so back to the cup of Psalms or the cup of deliverance. So a cup cannot be filled if it is already full. That's obvious, right? So in this metaphor, if we are filled with our own desires and agendas or ego, right, then God's blessing cannot rest with us. So we have to be an empty vessel in order for God to fill us up. Only when we empty ourselves of ego and seek to align our will with God's will, can we host the blessings God bestows upon us. So that's very deep and beautiful. Um, King David's cup of deliverance also alludes to this book of Psalms. With it, we are raised aloft and deliver, meaning draw blessings down. When we recite a blessing over a cup of wine, we lift the cup a hand breath above the table. So we are standing when we say the Kiddush, and then we lift the cup of wine off of the table. So it's... Um, you know, a few inches above the table. Similarly, the cup of deliverance, the book of Psalms, raises us above our mundane existence and heightens our consciousness so that we can appreciate the miraculous deliverances that God does for us. And just as a side note, my holistic healthcare practice where I help people to achieve their optimal health and well-being through nutrition, herbal supplements, and natural medicine it's called Mibaso, which is an acronym for mind, body, and soul. And Mibaso in Spanish means my cup or my vessel. And I utilized that um, metaphor and acronym also because the body is a vessel for the soul. So the body is like a sacred temple for our holy soul to reside. So um, that was just a shameless plug. <laughs> if anyone's interested in a holistic healthcare consultation, you can comment below and we will connect. All right. So furthermore, a little bit more information about David's cup. Um, this is more about the concealed versus revealed. So King David is synonymous with the divine trait of Malkut or kingship. So you may have seen the Kabbalistic tree of life, which has 10 spirot or spheres, and, and it has an 11th bonus one in the middle, da'at. So um, a cup which receives and dispenses liquid serves as a metaphor for Malkut. And Malkut is the spira or sphere on the bottom of the tree of life. So it's the, the last sphere on the, on the very bottom of the tree. So the function of this sphira is to receive and dispense divine energy. So all of the other um, attributes of God, as it were, are um, funneled down into malchut, which means kingdom or kingship. Okay, so of all the divine traits, because the above uh, seven are attributes that correspond with different 
aspects of God, Malchut is the one that directly engages a lower spiritual plane. The cup of Malchut is therefore in need of deliverance. Occasionally, it must be extracted from its entanglements with the spiritually distant worlds so it can concentrate on connecting to its divine source. David, King David, the voice of Malchut, because he was the king of Israel, thus says that he must raise the cup of deliverance in order to be delivered, to be replenished with divine light, Malchut must be raised and elevated from its contact with creation. Um, in the future, the process of imbuing creation with divine meaning will be complete. So right now we, we live in a world of concealment. We don't readily see God's um, like being in present in our world. But in the future, in the messianic era, when we live in the time of redemption, God will not be concealed. God would be, will be revealed. So at that time, the hierarchy will be overturned. God will be manifest in the material world with an intensity not found in the spiritual world. Mind blowing, right? I love it. <laughs> because of its involvement with creation, Malchut will then be closer to God than the other godly emanations. I know it's a little hard to grasp, but stay with me. At that time, Mahut, remember kingdom or kingship, will not need to be elevated to receive divine light. It will be wholly one with God. In fact, it will be elevated above all the other divine traits. At that time, the divine qualities of our forefathers and leaders will be inadequate means of praise only david king david malchut will be fit to say grace wow so cool <laughs> all right so the last thing that i want to share comes from verse 15 um it talks about the 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 verse says grievous in the eyes of god is the death of his pious ones but the word in hebrew is yakal and yakal actually means precious or expensive, just like um, precious stones such as diamonds are expensive. So precious or grievous in the eyes of God is the death of his pious ones, his righteous ones. When we suppress our drives and urges or our evil inclination, we kill, so to speak, our animalistic selfish soul. So righteous people, they rise above their lusts, right? They don't act on them. God cherishes this sacrifice. Thus, the death of his pious ones are precious in the eyes of God. So it doesn't necessarily mean the actual like death of the person, but they're overcoming their um, evil inclination or their you know, the voice in their head that tells them to, to sin, not to do good things. So this, um, this chapter of Psalm 116 was very interesting to me. I loved reading, um, it actually came up twice. Uveshe Madonai Kara is also in verse 17. And I just love how everything connects, like learning about the Kiddush, the, the, you know, this ritual that we do every single week, this day of rest, how the verses come from Psalms, some of them, and how everything is like interconnected and the concealed versus the revealed. And in the future, hopefully, maybe we merit to see um, God's revelation in everything. So the take home message today is um, just simple faith. And that will allow us to receive God's protection and um, to look for the deeper meaning and spirituality and depth and godliness behind even like mundane things. Thank you so much for watching and may God almighty bless you and all that you do. Have a great day. Bye-bye.